Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for pressing play on the Bituation Room podcast live show thing. Um, very, very happy to have you here. We've got such a great show today. Uh, we're going to dig into uh, what's going on in Montana and across this country when it comes to banning trans and gender affirming care. Fun. Uh, and also, um, we're going to look at, uh, oh God, something else that's even more fun, which is, uh, Bill Maher interviewing Elon Musk. You know, we have to talk about that because one of the people who rivals the amount that I despise Elon Musk and have despised Elon Musk is John Iderola of The Damage Report, and he is going to be joining me. I'm super excited. Uh, we're also going to have a final segment, a Ron versus Don. RVD, Ron V. Don, the beginning of many discussions about the Republican primary. So uh, ex exciting polling coming out, interesting polling coming out. But our main sitch is going to be focusing on another Democratic primary challenger to President Joe Biden. He goes by the name of RFK Jr. That means he's a Kennedy. Oh, yeah. He can and he's alive. Barely the pharmaceutical companies tried to get to him, but he resisted. No, he's also a raging anti-vaxxer. And for that discussion, uh, Julian Walker of Conspirituality Pod is back on the program. If you guys don't know, uh, Julian and Matthew, his co-host of Conspirituality Pod, they were on the bonus bish on Friday. We talked all about Marianne Williamson, which was fascinating. Um Really good discussion. Re they broke it down so succinctly. And I encourage all y'all to become patrons to, or become members on YouTube to be able to look and watch, look in that back. So look in your eyes back to that, um, you know, um, mouth moving um, sounds discussion. Um, <laughs> Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. You know what it is. You know how to get there. You know it's you and only you who makes this show possible. Um, and again, you get the bonus bish available to, for watch back and in your little ear holes in our beautiful little rainbow colored um, RSS feed, you know, your special little Patreon. So that's very, very fun. And thanks to everyone who's become a patron since again, 10 bucks gets you that shout out. In addition to a lot of other perks, uh, need I mention the American Prospect once again, deep discounts on getting that magazine to you uh, digitally and uh, physically. So uh, hell yeah, let's 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 you know let's do the damn thing. Let's do the damn thing. I want to start off also by saying you know happy Asian American and uh, Pacific Islander month. That's my month. A little bit of my month. Um, so, hey, yay. Yay for me. Yay for us. Um, and uh, also, like, solidarity with the writers. Uh, this is not what I'm bitching about, but I do want to just mention. If you guys know uh, what I do, which is in the nexus of journalism, comedy, writing, online content, I am not currently in the WGA. However... What has happened to television writing is that they've made all uh, all writing uh, treated as scummily as some of us who've been working on the Internet have been treated for a very long time in terms of uh, no representation, lack of pay. Well, the representation now, but like a very, very um, uh, sort of a whittling down of valuing the our, our, of our work. And um, that happens in journalism and that happens in writing of all kinds, right? Whether it's writing in television or film. And so WGA is currently on strike, basically demanding that just because a show is streaming doesn't mean that they should be paid any less. People are having a very hard time making ends meet. Um, writing is no longer a dependable job in Hollywood. Um, it is incredibly precarious, just like all jobs. So that is partly what I'm bitching about. And I'm just like, y'all, AI can't do it for you, okay? AI's not gonna write your next hit show. It's just not. And uh, we don't want it to. Um, and lastly, the one thing, this is very funny, this is an aside, but a, some, a Google AI, um, I think development 
like some engineer, dude, like years ago, he turns to me and he goes, you know what AI can't do? You know what we haven't been able to do is uh, program a sense of humor into robots. And I'm like, hell yeah, exactly. Fuck that. That robot's going to bomb. Bomb. Put put that robot up at the comedy store. Let's see how good it does. No, but truly, you can't really teach senses of humor. You know, you just have to be born with it. No big deal. Um, and uh, they're going to try. Oh, they'll definitely try and float like an AI, like influencer slash stand-up comic. But it just makes me think, like, going back to what I love about stand-up is that it's just you there the microphone, the audience, the feedback is immediate, that whether it, it worked or didn't work is immediate and wonderful. Um, and that cannot be supplanted. That being said, it is a completely devalued job that is underpaid. You'll be lucky if you get paid sometimes in a fucking coupon to a Safeway. I'm not even joking. One time I got paid in a, uh, a Safeway, like one of those little uh, Monopoly money things where like, you know, it was very sad. Not all stand-up gigs pay that shittily. I've gotten off track, guys. Let's get into it. W what else are you bitching about? <laughs> this is What Are You Bitching About? And let's just bring him in. Because, you know, I've said his name. And if I invoke it a third time, he's just going to appear. And I don't want that. Uh, but... Host of the Damage Report on the Young Turks Network. Please welcome John Idarola. John? No te escucho. No te puedo oír. I can't hear you, John. You would think that I haven't done literally thousands of hours of live video and have had to point out many times when a guest has accidentally muted themselves and instantly could tell in my earphones that I wasn't audible and yet nothing, <laughs> nothing. I need to sleep more, I think. Anyway, hello, everyone. How's it going? John, so good to have you here. It does not matter. Uh, you can be muted as long as you find that button and unmute. I get it. Look, first of all, you mute because, you know, you're making like, you know, you got to you got to rip a fart. You got to make some lip smacking sounds, whatever you need to do. I was actually um, typing, but one of those two right. things is possible <laughs> as well. <laughs> John, welcome to the my favorite portion, which is, uh, again, sort of the one that I make very long, which is what what are you bitching about? I have something, but why don't you go first as my guest? Yeah. What are you bitching about? Well, I think I'm bitching this week, I think, about what everyone would predict I'm bitching about. It's that I have once again been callously passed over for the Met Gala. Uh, wasn't there. I mean, I, I like to think <laughs> that I bring that sort of uh, je ne sais quoi in my fashion every day, basically. John, you can't um, just cosplay okay. when you get to the Met Gala, all right? You, you can't totally just show can't. up as Ant-Man, you know what I mean? That's true. But if I dressed as an elf, it would be like, oh, interesting. It's some sort of like new forest chic or something. <laughs> you know, they'd love it. Anyway, I'm joking. I actually really don't care, except I did recently just see uh, Florence Pugh at the Met Gala, and now I definitely wish more than anything else that I had been there. But anyway... Um, besides that, 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 that's not what I'm bitching about. So what I'm John about is, John is, first of all, if we're being honest, John has a few unanswered DMs to Florence Pugh, just shooting his shot. A few? You know, why not? A few. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. I don't even think she's on Twitter. Anyway, um, uh, and I love my pregnant wife. So anyway, um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's not what I'm bitching about. So what I'm really bitching about is this is way more personal than I usually go. Sure. It's kind of like it's the new version of if you had to ever like go to a new school or move to a new city and you have to like sort of figure out, OK, so what am I here? I guess. What do I bring over? What's new or whatever? So um, I recently joined up on Blue Sky. Right. And it reminds me of when I started on TikTok, where it's like, I immediately have to think, so what does anyone want out of me here? And Can it's very confusing. Remind people what yes, good point. Blue Sky so, is. So there have been many attempts to replace Twitter. You know, you had uh, Post Notes, and you had Spotify, and you had Mastodon, and those still exist. Um, but they haven't really taken off. It, the belief is that Blue Sky might be the social media site that replaces Twitter. It's made by the guy who made Twitter. It is virtually indistinguishable from Twitter as of 10 years ago. Is um, it actually Jack's platform? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's very similar to Twitter. It still doesn't have a lot of features. It doesn't have DMs. It doesn't have video. But like AOC came over and the Washington Post is there now. And there's some some famous people and some politicians. Did she follow and... you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She followed me. I was one of her first 30 follows. Please. What? Um, and that she was... followed me and I just wanted to hold that over you, but I guess I can't. Yeah. You know, I actually, it, that was like one of the positive things so far in there is, you know, it was years ago that she followed me on Twitter and we don't interact very much, obviously. Um, uh, is that obvious? I don't know. I cry Unanswered about it DMs. Speaking but, of um, unanswered DMs, am I endless. right? Am uh, I right, chat? And snail mail. <laughs> uh, what do you think this typewriter's for? Anyway, um... So she followed me, which is good, you know, and it shows that she still, I guess, acknowledges who I am. But I don't know what I want to use it for. Like, I yeah. mostly use my Twitter to, like, you know, promote things that I'm interested in or stories that I'm researching. But this is such a new thing with such a different sort of audience that like, I have no idea what the point of me is on there. And, like, I probably shouldn't even be thinking about it. But when you go to a new site, for me, it's like, should I be reinventing myself? Right. Everyone's Am I someone posting new? posting their ass. Yeah. Should I be doing that? I don't know. No, it's a lot of ass. It definitely is a lot of butt. And uh, it's it's what they call, you know, the kids or, you know, my husband calls shit posters. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, it is Matt Lieb's birthday. Please send him Happy a birthday. shout out. He He's turning into one of those people that doesn't like to be reminded that it's their birthday. And I hate those people. So just... <laughs> rub it in so he can embrace it. But yeah, I think that's an interesting way to think thing to bitch about. I am on Blue Sky as well and I'm I'm there and I'm going, "Oh, cool, another platform I won't post to." Like <laughs> another thing to add to the anxiety of I should be more on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram, on, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, "Ooh, yep. fun on YouTube, more wiki feed." Yeah. Exactly. So, but luckily your stalkers do that one for you for free. And I'm just like, can one of my stalkers do this? You know? So <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, just, uh, it's overwhelming. Like I don't especially care because I, I don't have a lot of time to spend on any of these sites really, but you know, like we do this job because we care about the stuff we talk about and we talk about it, even if it, you know, didn't have a lot of people paying attention, but if you're going to talk about it and if you're passionate about it, you want people to hear it. And so I don't want to get left behind. And then, you know, like it's already hard enough to get people to pay attention on the platforms I'm relatively large on about like climate change and stuff like that. It's right. like, I feel like I got to be keeping up, but I don't know exactly what I want to use it for. So it's just sort of like an internal bitching this week. I like that. I think, I think don't, you know, embrace the duality of yourself or the tr truality or the quadrality of one's own personality. Mm -hmm. I think this is going somewhere. This does feel like that Josh Hawley uh, motivational speech. Oh my God. We, we spoke about on your program. I need purpose is what's going on. I just think anyway. it's like, yeah, just be yourself. Just be whatever you want to be, but be more of yourself. That sounds like a lot, but I'll, I need I'll think more. About it. If you could add another IA in front of your Ida Rolla, so it's like Iaiada -E Rolla, you know, <laughs> that's what I want there. E I E I O. E I E I O. -E <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't know why I've been fucking with your name lately. I'm a nursery um, rhyme to you. <laughs> That's good. It's a good thing to bitch about. Very, very um, uh, self interested. Mine is more thinking about other people. Uh, oh. No, I'm bitching about the fact that Donald Trump is a rapist and we just don't talk about it like it's so clearly evident right in front of us. And right now, right, his civil rape trial is going forward uh, in New York. Um, and E. Jean Carroll, who accused him of rape in, I believe, 96 uh, in a Bergdorf Goodman um, dressing room, it has recounted her story yet again. It is incredibly believable yet again in terms of the how it went down, how they were flirting and everything seemed like hunky dory and fine. And she was like a successful writer and he knew he, who, who she was and, and she knew who he was. And they were just kind of like having a good little afternoon, flirty, flirty, flirty. And then he got violent. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, this fool has been a rapist. And today, I believe today, one of her friends testified in that civil case um, which is about money. It's not, there is, there are going to be no criminal uh, uh, crimes or um, convictions or anything, no charges, yeah. criminal charges, obviously I said civil case. So it's really about 
you defamed me over this incident that you know was true. Um, and I, you should pay damages for that. You should pay damages for all that I have endured for setting aside the fact that you committed a crime um, and that you traumatized me. So yes, her friend testified that she called her as soon as it happened. Her friend was like, you've been raped. You need to go to the police. And she was like, no, I'm not gonna go. Please don't tell anybody ever and never mention this again. And her friend didn't until, until he was elected president. And she decided to come out with her story and published her memoirs and, and spoke about it. And Trump said, and I, uh, I quote, when asked, I believe this was by The Hill, I'll say it with great respect. Number one, she isn't my type. And number two, it never happened. It never happened. Okay. Now, John, I don't know when you're trying to defend your innocence on a crime, if you say, oh, no, I'm not. I didn't murder that person. My weapon is a rope, not a knife. Also, yeah. I didn't do it. Like what? It's yeah. just so. Maybe go with that. For, like if you're accused of cheating, don't say who has the time. Also, I didn't cheat on you. Like lead with the denial, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. But lead anyway, yeah. With the denial. So it, I'm just, I'm just like, it's so disgusting to me. Like I, rem I, you, you, you listen to her and you read her testimony and it just sends chills down your spine. And also you're like, this is who we elected fucking president, man. And this is one of dozens of sexual assault allegations yeah. against Trump. Yeah. It's, you, you know, I, I'm glad that you, the, the way that you led was saying um, in terms of the way that we talk about it, that we don't really grapple with what happened. And I think that that's hundred percent right. And normally, you know, I would be saying a criticism like that, like outward, but even for me, like I've talked about this specific case, I don't know, seven times, eight times, something like that. Yeah. But even I don't really like mentally drill down on what it actually represents. And, and I think that that's kind of a constant in politics, like, especially because we have been trained over the years to believe that the, the serious things that politicians do that are real, don't, don't even worry about those. They have no chance of consequences whatsoever. It's stuff around the edges, the periphery, norm stuff that maybe will get them. Like, this seems so minor compared to the confidential documents or whatever, when the human cost obviously is a thousand times worse when it comes to this rape. Yeah. Let alone, you know, what he did in the Middle East. Let alone the effect that he had on the pandemic. Like, these things that are, that are real, like, you almost have to keep them at arm's reach, I guess, if you're going to be a person that's going to engage with politics, you know, in an ongoing fashion. But you're right. It's... What he did in that one instant, instant. If if it was anyone else, it would be the single worst thing they had ever done in their life, and it yeah. would be all that was necessary for you to never associate with that person again. Yeah. For Trump, it's one of a hundred things that would qualify for that, and you can't keep all of them simultaneously in your head. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I think that's and 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 if it were a Democrat who had done that, I mean, how quickly they would step away, the party would step away from them because, yeah. you know, the Democratic Party, for as corporate loving as they are, has some amount of uh, uh, moral standards and, um, you know, it play by different rules, which is not fair. Right. The whole thing is not fair. We should hold all people accountable. And, you know, granted, the one silver lining of all of this is that I do think Trump basically single-handedly, um, not to give credit to a man for the Me Too movement, but electing a rapist to the presidency. And granted, this was after the fact, but he, grabbed by the pussy, other allegations, um, electing him truly did something to the minds of like all people, but specifically women when it comes to, oh, motherfuckers are going to fail up. These yep. cretins, these predators just keep failing up. And especially in politics, which as I've said on your show in a million times, is the last place that predators can really hide and still maintain a job. Hello, Matt Gates. Yeah, sometimes with lifetime appointments. <laughs> right, sometimes with lifetime appointments. I mean, when or when, when are we going to believe women? Just give me one instance when it's like, oh, Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, you don't get it. You, sorry, you don't get this job. Oh, Christine Blasey Ford, attempted rape. All right. Uh, no, sorry, Kevin. Not like when is a man in public in the public eye and you know gonna actually, actually be so called canceled? Right. Um, I don't know. Chris Hardwick. I mean, there's one of them. Yeah, he was, I... he was sort of. He had a weird abusive relationship. 
I don't know. Fuck, man. Anyway, it's it's not common. It's not common. So anywho, and especially in politics. So I would say everyone who thinks they've been canceled in Hollywood, go run for something. <laughs> um, don't give Johnny Depp any idea. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of State Depp. Oh, God. Um, he actually that'd be that'd be tight. He would just give like rings and and sort of and like scarves to everyone internationally. That's how he would build peace. He'd build a bridge um, on high between fashion. North and South Korea, like out of like different <laughs> di um, ring, ring, ring fingers. I can't speak brocaded today. cravats. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Swashbuckling boots. Okay, you know what? Let's get into this week. Let's continue on with two things. A bunch happened, but only two things in my book. This is the week where. So this was the week where uh, the state of Montana passed a bill to bar gender affirming care for anyone under the age of 18. Um, and during a, well, let's, no, let's no and first. Let's just look at this bill and let's look at who signed this bill. Um, so this bill is uh, one of many that have been passed across the country. So, uh, Montana, not unique here, um, here, this is according to, uh, human rights campaign, all a list of all of these, I don't know, 20 odd States that have made an effort to ban, um, gender affirming care for trans youth. Um, so they're not alone and they're going to go for more. Uh, looks like that Montana is also trying to, um, bar uh like the other box in terms of sex so sex is just two things male female uh and that students can't identify as anything other than he or she they can't oh they can't change their pronouns that's all coming later but let's talk about who signed this bill um and then we'll talk about what happened uh inside the legislature but governor um greg Gian john forte signed that bill on friday um, that had been condemned before as unconscionable by Zoe Zephyr, the first uh, openly transgender lawmaker. But John Forte himself, uh, I don't know if you guys know this about him, uh, or John, you knew this. He uh, body slammed a Guardian reporter in 2017. Um, that That's sort of his claim to fame. But interestingly, for this story, he has a non-binary son, David John Forte. Um, so I guess they they identify as they. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm I'm misgendering, so... Uh, but yeah, here's David. He says, for my own sake, I've chosen to focus primarily on transgender rights as as that would significantly directly affect a number of my friends. Uh, referring to the proposal to restrict transition health care for kids and, and separate legislation to expressly define sex as binary in Montana code for, and banning drag performances from public spaces, David added, I would like to make the argument that these bills are immoral, unjust, and frankly, a violation of human rights. And once again, David, my bad for for misgendering but so that's that's his son john and he's going ahead and going yeah. like oh, this is this is what we're doing so in this case would we give gianforte extra credit because normally what republicans do is they uh deny people basic human dignity let alone actual legal recognition until there's a direct member of their family. And that's when they remember, oh, we're supposed to be creatures with some sort of empathy or compassion. Mm -hmm. And then that can make them seem a little bit like hypocrites. So he's decided to just avoid that and just tell even his own immediate family to F off. Yeah. Like he's not absolutely. gonna extend any empathy to them too. I guess he's pure in the end. I yeah. mean that, look, I, 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 I'm in the process of having a kid, uh, don't have one yet, but I have to imagine that like they should be able to get through to me and and by the way like Jim Forte like every republican in the country didn't care about this one electrons worth 3 years ago nope they did not care they didn't think about it because it wasn't an actual problem that needed to be fixed all of this is like it's just contingent it's 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 convenient it's it's nice right now for them to be focusing on this. It's a way to get their base ginned up, distracted from other issues. That's it. And maybe this helps him pursue long-term um, goals. I don't know exactly what those would be. Maybe he thinks he's going to join the Senate or something. And that is what he is weighing against the acceptance of his heirs, his offspring. 
mm-hmm. man, what a heartless POS. Although we knew that because when we first found out about him, it was from him uh, violently assaulting a member of the press. So I guess we can't be too surprised. No, exactly. I mean, that's quite a legacy. It's like, oh, yeah, he's a POS through and through. Um, and this is what he's doing to his own kid. So great. And and you're right about being sort of, yeah, being like pure. Um and the fact that it's all a giant distraction. You know, when Montanans are like getting their SNAP benefits uh, ripped away from them uh, and they can't make ends meet on full time work and they are getting evicted from their homes. I'm just, you know, I'm sure they'll be happy that at least um, one child out of however many hundreds uh, was not able to live their true lives as their true gender preference. Yeah, that that must feel good when you. What? Um, but anyway, uh, it obviously this is again that red meat for whatever base, and I don't know if it actually works politically. But what really happened, and the reason this is not going to stick, is because people like David um, are voting for people like Zoe, and Zoe Zephyr is the first transgender legislator in Montana. And uh, during a debate uh, for uh, around this bill. She told her colleagues that if they support this measure, they're going to have, quote, blood on their hands. Um, and then she was censured. Uh, and the latest update is that she is filing a lawsuit with the ACLU uh, over her removal from the House floor. And she's very much tried. This is her the day after she was censured and uh, expelled. Um she spent the first day of her exile last week battling to use a bench in the state house hallway. She sit here, so you can see her sort of with her computer and her, her coffee. Her key card to access capital entrances, bathrooms, and party workspaces uh, was deactivated, according to the lawsuit. Um, and this is according to uh, the ACLU. Every minute matters. Without Zephyr having her full rights and privileges restored, her 11,000 constituents are voiceless when it comes to a budget bill that impacts every corner of Montana. Um, and she uh, she represents uh, the college town of Missoula and um, it's House District 100. And just so you get a sense of the support she has here was here. She was speaking. Just listen to the crowd uh, days after she was censured. a big trans flag flying. So they love her. They love her. And and just finally, I want to, why it matters is the following, right? And Zoe puts it so perfectly in this interview. Take a look. And to me, what you're seeing is when marginalized communities stand up and hold people accountable to the real harm that legislation does. It's not enough for the right to have the votes to pass it. They want silence. They don't want to be held accountable. They want to use whatever tools are at their disposal to mandate that silence. Yeah. So they had the votes already to, pa- to pass this. She just spoke her, said her piece, John. There was no mm-hmm. reason. Like they were going to get their way anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they were going to get their legislative way. Their full way, I think uh, the representative touched on it right there. And by the way, I'm going to be uh, speaking with uh, Representative Zephyr tomorrow on the damage report. Amazing. Um, we had a scheduling conflict that stopped us from talking last Friday. Um, they had their way legislatively, but that's not the only way that they want to have their way. Uh, they want to silence people in general, yes, but how great for them that they get to silence an actual trans lawmaker. This right. bill is about pushing the community at least into the shadows, if not off the edge of a cliff. And so getting to do it to an individual as well, how nice is that for them? Um, it's about enforcing hierarchies. They're doing that by uh, asserting silence. like, And they have convinced their base to hate every trans person. Zoe Zephyr is a great representation. You're supposed to hate her. And when you hate her, how much delight will you get from us silencing her? She's yeah. a bad person. We're going to hurt her. That's what they have been trained to to enjoy. That's the only thing they've been trained to expect out of their elected representatives is pain to the people they've been trained to hate, to hate so much that they don't realize how much they're being robbed by the status quo, a status quo that the Republicans uh, universally support. And yet, John, free free speech. What about the freedom of mm-hmm. free speech? And well, and they're against cancel culture, too. Oh, none yeah, of this meant, none of this meant anything. Like, honestly, like I tried to fight back for years as cancel culture, like the, the term cancel culture became a thing that was talked about and tried to remind everyone 
This is just the exact same thing that we have every couple of years. They come up with a new term that just means you get to say racist, homophobic, misogynistic, Islamophobic things, and you can't have a problem with it. But if you do something I don't like, I'm going to shut you down. That's all it was. It meant Mm -hmm. nothing. Now they're doing the boycotts against everything. They're shooting up bottles with AR-15s, and they're literally expelling lawmakers for being uncouth. Yep, absolutely. Let alone alone book bannings and all that. Yeah, I mean, it feels it feels like a last gasp. It, I I I want the 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 optimist in me says all of this is a, just a last gasp, right? It's like Republicans know they're losing. They've tried to gerrymander everything. They've tried to suppress votes. They're going to continue doing that. But all of these, the peeling back of the layers of progress, is like they think this is maybe what their voters want when it absolutely is not. And they have nothing else to run on and they need to distract us from actual issues. Um, yep. And they don't want to actually deliver for their, you know, for their constituents, as we've talked about in, in terms of basic ass things like gun control, climate preparedness, um, uh, you know, a minimum wage raise. Yep. So like it feels desperate. And I think that it is desperate. Um, and that is why they're going through this kind of stuff. That being said, You've got where we want to be, which is, you know, political revolution, let's be real. And you've got here, beginning of Handmaid's Tale, horrible authoritarian nightmare. (laughs) And here is like, I know we're going to get to a political, like, I know we will. I'm not saying, I'm not doing some like uh, Condoleezza Rice, slavery would have eventually ended on its own. I'm not saying that. (laughs) I mean, I'm saying that like, I know this is a last gas, last gas, but we have this like moment and these laws are going to be repealed. I feel I know they will because these fucking millennials are going to grow up or these Gen Zers are going to grow up and they're going to vote them out. But in the meantime, people are dying. In the meantime, trans mm-hmm. youth are at risk. In the meantime, women are dying from a lack of reproductive care and people with uteruses. So like. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like we need to. J- yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think impatience is uh, an understandable state to be in when you're seeing so much harm, uh, you know, uh, being like foisted onto so many individuals and communities. Yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, well, let's move on to something um, even more enjoyable. A palate cleanse, uh, because um, this was the week where um, Elon Musk, uh, CEO of Twitter, um, crushing it, really, uh, a week where if you put former blue check mark haver in your bio, you could get a blue check mark for free. <laughs> um, a week where once again Elon proves he has no idea what he's doing. He is immensely stupid and especially stupid when it comes to business, maybe. He went on to uh Bill Maher show, uh real time, I believe it is or canceled or whatever he's calling his himself these days. He went on to Bill Maher's show and um, Bill Maher proceeded to suck his dick. That is what happened. That is just what happened. And the best part about this interview, John, is that it starts and Elon's like not sure he wants to drop trow. He's like, oh, are you really going to do this? Are you going to just completely just like go down? And, and Bill Maher's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I am. So... The, I'm not going to play it, but the the few questions, listen to these hardball questions, John. Mar starts off with, you do a lot of work in a day, don't you? Ugh. Um, And then he says, there's few people who make change happen. You're one of those people. And like Elon's like, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And the audience is clapping. He's like, I, I love this audience. Then he says, you're a likable guy. I like that you have a sense of humor. I like, this is verbatim, I like that you use your powers for good. So this is in the first minute, y'all. This is the first minute is just like, you're a likable guy, aren't you? I mean, you've got a great sense of humor. I mean, you're like really buff. I mean, I bet your dick's like nine inches. Like, I bet, like, so you are like amazing in bed, aren't you? Like, there is, I'm sorry, but he, it is the most pandery, sad little, it's like, Bill, baby. You're, you're going to get the invite to the Christmas party. Calm down. You, you're going to be on SpaceX. You're going to see the launch. Free bl- Twitter blue. Free Twitter blue. Honestly, $8 a month, you've earned it. But here is the moment that I want to play for you. Because uh, it was, they really did get into pressing matters. There was some AI talk. 
There was a little bit of talk of Twitter. Um, but here is where they really discuss the, the most terrifying thing that's happening in our world today. A lot of people thought when you bought Twitter that this is kind of an outlier. Like, how does this, what doesn't fit with sure. these other things you're doing? I never thought that. Oh, because yeah. I think you're dealing with big civilizational issues and problems. And I <laughs> was right on your page. I think Twitter is one of them. I mean, you have talked. Civilizational problem, John. Twitter. Civilization. Western civilization. All right, I'm going to keep playing it. <laughs> talked about this yeah. woke mind virus. Yes. In, in really apocalyptic terms. Yeah. I don't, you should explain why you don't think it's hyperbole to say things like it's pushing civilization towards suicide. First of all, what is the woke mind virus? And if we don't deal with this, nothing else can get done. Tell me why you think that. Well, it, um, it starts in the anal region and um, you have to, it itches quite a lot. And then the scales. Um, uh. <laughs> anyway, the boils. Yeah, oh, the boils. So, um, I think we need to be very cautious about any anything that is anti meritocratic, um, and anything that is uh, that that results in the suppression of, of free speech. Um, so, you know, those are two of the aspects of the work mind virus that I think are very dangerous. Uh, is that it's, it's often anti meritocratic. You can't you can't question things. Uh, even the questioning is bad. So, uh, you know. Can, yes, please. Can jump we pause in. it? Okay, because there's already so much there. So, first of all, uh, he has not defined it yet. He's given two things that he thinks he would attribute to it. Um, okay, first of all, when he said, he's like, he's looking away because he's a genius who's thinking very hard. And then he says, or the suppression of free speech, like he had just come up with the most intelligent point ever yes mm -hmm. i understand that your brand is that supposedly you're for free speech or whatever you know unless it's like your workers talking about unionizing or people talking about how you've created an incredibly racist uh, and misogynistic environment you don't like that speech so much what about the ndas you've put multiple women under how much of a, a uh, like a radical free speech guy actually are you so he pretends there that the thing about the woke mind virus is that it's anti-meritocratic which isn't even how I hear other people who've replaced no. their entire personality with an opposition to wokeness have talked about it before. But so what? Uh, so Twitter is the battleground that you're fighting. Are you going to stop legacy admissions to universities? Like who thinks that this is representative of an actual push for more meritocracy in society? Many well, people would say the point. Yeah, he, this is a fucking billionaire arguing like the in uh, for meritocracy mm -hmm. like which is basically like i literally deserve every single penny that i have no one helped me I, by myself i deserve all of this and he looks around the world and he's like yeah yeah this is great this is meritocratic like this is this is equal like everyone's earned you know earned what they have and yeah. everything is fair everything is fair motherfucker like this is this is someone who has never faced a day of adversity in their life right mm -hmm. they were born sort of you know shouting at workers in an emerald mine just like you know like what Th that it's just incredible to me and that's what he's saying he's basically saying that not only he later says like you know any kind of free speech but he's basically like um please don't talk about or give any preferential treatment to anyone who has, and will they get into this, um, suffered at the hands of, you know, colonialism or um, mm -hmm. legacies of slavery or uh, any of the other people that we employed in my mind. Um, you know, like, yeah, it's, yeah. Look, there, there is a hierarchy that has been set up. The conservatives deep down into their DNA want that hierarchy to continue. And why wouldn't they? The hierarchy has been set up so that when they were born, they were already the best in every category. The woke mind virus is anything that implies that any layer of that hierarchy doesn't actually make like physics based on the laws of the universe and is actually just a thing that was set up generally by violence. Yep. That's, that's all it is. And man, these people, what an interview, by the way. Every time one of them speaks, I think, wait, I think I hate that one more. And then the other <laughs> one speaks, and I think, no, actually, I hate the other one more. But the big issue there is every one of these guys 
is obsessed with the idea that they're saying things you're not allowed to say. Tucker yes. Carlson can't go five minutes without saying that. Um, and I would love to get them to accept that you can say anything you want. You can ask any question you want. And I can respond to that. They are, it's, they're asserting that they can't ans ask a question when what they're saying is they ask the question and we shouldn't be allowed to respond to it. And on an HBO show. Yeah. On an HBO which show, there, which he still has, which by the way, later in the yeah. interview, he says, um, and first of all, the answer on who is worse in this interview is Bill Maher 150 percent like Elon knows know. he's a piece of shit like Elon knows deep down he's full of shit and he's ultimately like caping for white supremacy and that's all he's doing. And but Bill Maher still thinks that he's a fucking hero like he thinks somehow yeah, that he's that's true. And and so. Bill Maher later says, like, what do you do? Twitter has a mob of mean girls. And Elon and says, and he's never been more right, I would ignore it. As if he could ignore the haters that pile on him. As if he could ignore it and take his own goddamn advice. He says, I would ignore it. And then Bill Maher goes, oh, but they're going to cancel me. They could take my job away. This fool thinks he is, like, you're, you're going extinct because you're unfunny, bro. You're not going extinct because people on Twitter don't like you. Like... So anyway, yeah, but or, by the way, they're allowed to not like you. You yes. think that they're obligated to think that you're funny or interesting or clever? How the hell is that the way that either capitalism or free speech is supposed to work? Thank you. Let's play a little bit more and then we'll stop. You know, another way to you know, almost synonymous would be, would be cancel culture. And obviously people have tried to cancel you many times. Many times. Yeah. I mean, you're, every week. Yeah. Daughters uh, go to college in, in or, sorry, go to high school in, in the Bay Area. Um, and, oh, sorry, um, high school. I forgot how old they are. Are they old enough to date? Because that's, you know, anyway. And he, he was well, asking them, did. like, well, <laughs> so who are the, you know, who are the first few presidents of the United States? Uh, the, 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 they could name Washington. Uh, but, and I said, well, what do you know about him? Well, he was a slave owner. What else? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> right. I'm like, uh, okay, that's maybe you should know more than that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He had wooden teeth, okay? Yeah. He's on a dollar bill. God. I would love that, to hear and that, like 20 facts about Washington, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Please, please enlighten us. That is the wolf mind virus. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the, uh, you know, slavery is obviously a, a, a horrific institution, but, but we should still know more about George Washington than and, that. And by the way, one that was practiced all over the world yes, yes. forever it, since the beginning of time by every race, yes. including people of color. There you go. Yeah, there they, they it, it is. They got to it. There's yeah. the talking point for Nazis. There's the white nationalist fucking talking point. Yep. Well, and by the way, like he's he says, you know, they only know this one thing as if the issue is the lack of knowledge rather than the thing that they know. Because I didn't hear him immediately transition to saying we should fund public education more. By the way, it's a joke. They're not going to public schools, I'm sure. But, okay, so should they generally know more, or is it that they know this thing? Because, honestly, look, you could know any number of just one facts about George Washington. The fact that he thought it was morally acceptable to own other human beings, that seems relevant. That seems like it would <laughs> gonna, affect other things. Mm -hmm. Like, if, I, if my buddy oh, from gonna, high school mm -hmm. was really good at Texas Hold'em, loved Pop-Tarts, and owned people... Which of those three should you start with when <laughs> recounting his life and times? <sighs> but I knew his heart. That's what they're saying. They're yeah. saying this is not about making sure that people know more. They both are deeply uncomfortable with people knowing that. They Absolutely. do not want you to focus on this bad stuff. That's it. You shouldn't know about it. You shouldn't consider it. Racism, I guess, was bad before, as if Elon Musk would have been fighting against it at the time had he been around. Um, it's but just definitely so funny. don't think like, about the racism that still exists. I, you know, it's it's funny because, like, I feel like in order to talk about cancel culture and being canceled, you already have to be a millionaire. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you because, you know, like, I dream, like, I, I hope to be cancelable one day, like a, a, a bull, you know what I'm saying? Because in order to be canceled, you have to be somebody. And I think that it's amazing and ironic that the loudest voices you hear talk about cancel culture are doing it on the biggest platforms mm -hmm. consistently, meaning 
It isn't real. It is in their goddamn heads. And as you said, if one day, and oh, Bill Maher can't wait for this day, HBO decides to move the fuck on to somebody else, oh, how he's going to weaponize that, however that happens, and, you know, and tour off of it. He's already touring on a, on a show called, like, Cancelled or Uncancelable or whatever, something triggered. Roseanne Barr triggered, exactly. <laughs> um, and you're just like, just go. Just be your little boomer martyr. Um Anyway, uh, they deserve each other and we don't deserve them. And speaking of someone we deserve, coming in to join us for the sitch to talk about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is running for, that's right, president, going to try and primary President Joe Biden, um, co-host of the co-host of the Conspirituality Podcast, where he discusses the new age conspiracism, right-wing propaganda, yoga wellness to red pilled pipeline. And co-author of Conspirituality, How New Age Conspiracy Theories Became a Health Threat. Welcome back once again, Julian Walker. Great to be here with you. I, I was laughing. I was laughing at that last segment. I want to tell you that we call it the censorship megaphone effect. <laughs> it's a gambit that you do. Uh, conspiracy theorists do it. Right-wing influencers do it, where you claim that you're being horribly censored and then you ride that wave all the way to the bank, all the way to a much bigger platform. You get featured on Joe Rogan. You tell Joe Rogan it's really terrible and his 11 million viewers go, yeah, you're being censored. This is awful. Julian, let me ask you a question and John, you can answer that too. If I today with my um, 40 some thousand odd subscribers on YouTube, nothing to sneeze at, but you know, decidedly yeah. less uh, than someone like Joe Rogan. If I today were to say, I'm being canceled and just keep on saying it. Do you think I too would get an HBO show and get onto Joe Rogan and become incredibly popular? I mean, isn't that how it works? It would work that way if you were willing to then form alliances with all of the strange bedfellows who came your way. And I, unfortunately, that would be trending further to the right with each handshake. Well, uh, I have a sort of doomsday clock on my phone, uh, at which point, if I don't make it in this, uh, by being honest, uh -huh. the year 2028, guys, it's over. It's yeah. over. I'm going blonde. We're going to shill. We're going to shill for this <laughs> snake oil salesman. Um, You're going to do the Dave Rubin, essentially. We'll do the Dave Rubin. I mean, it was really John Iderola who made me realize that I was, at heart, a conservative. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He just pushed me to the brink with his wokeness. Um, it's the mind virus that's in there. <laughs> the important thing with the woke vi mind virus is that you do not get vaccinated against it because that's actually that's right. worse than the virus itself. That's true. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, well, let's just because I, I I could take us through an article explaining who RFK Jr. is, mm. but I feel like Julian, you you guys have done enough research on him to sort of tell us who the hell he is, and I I will play a clip from one of his speeches. Well, I mean, clearly, he's uh, he's the son of uh, political royalty in the United States. Uh, he is a former uh, law school professor. He was an environmental lawyer for many years. He really established a solid reputation as someone who was uh, doing that kind of work, uh, going after corporations and government in terms of their uh, offenses against the environment and pollution and that sort of thing. And then around 2005, he started to be swayed by uh, anti-vax arguments. Hmm. And by 2016, he had founded the Children's Defense Fund. I believe it's Children's Health Defense mm -hmm. is the name of the organization. Yeah. And uh, by 2019, he was one of the two biggest spenders on anti-vax ads on Facebook. And wow. uh, it's, it's been rolling. Uh, by 2019, I believe. Oh, that's fun. So after we realized... Facebook, after Facebook said they were going to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's part of why we have that data, right? Was because there was there was increasing scrutiny on like what's actually going on here. Who's how, how is big tech profiting from mm -hmm. this misinformation, and who are the people who are giving them the money? And it turned out RFK Jr. was one of the two biggest uh, spenders in that regard. That's crazy. Yeah. That 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 one eighty is so sad and bizarre. Well, it's interesting, you know. You can see how if, if we take if we assume that he's sincere, right, which mm -hmm. I like to do, you can see how the transition from being opposed to pollution of the external environment could translate in an emotional sense into 
the sort of symbolism of protecting innocent children against their bloodstreams being polluted by vaccines. And he bought into the whole idea that the MMR vaccine was causing autism and became a mouthpiece for that. He became sort of aligned with Andrew Wakefield, who started that off and later admitted that he made all of that up after he was had his medical license stripped. <sighs> yeah. Um, good shit. Uh, he, <laughs> so he now he wants to run for president. Um, yep. This was him actually at an anti-mandate uh, like, uh, rally in oh, here D.C., we go. This is some fun stuff. And obviously yeah. his voice is the voice of a Kennedy. I mean, it's or a chain smoker or a little bit of both. Um, <laughs> is it an affectation, Julian? Is he putting no, it on? No, he has, a, he has a condition that makes his voice sound like that. It's, it's called dysphonia, I believe. Okay. All right. Yeah, but that's, so, on, that's on top of the blue blood you know, pronunciation and cadence. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Here he is. Within five years, we're going to see 415,000 low orbit satellites. Bill Gates says his 65,000 satellites alone will be able to look at every square inch of the planet 24 hours a day. They're putting in 5G to harvest our data and control our behavior. Digital currency that will allow them to punish us from a distance and cut off our food supply. Vaccine passports. The minute they hand you that vaccine passport, Every right that you have is transformed into a privilege contingent upon your obedience to arbitrary government dictates. It will make you a slave. Mm, shoots at the screen. Uh, so that there he is. I mean, this is incredible. This is conspiracy theory bingo, right? He, he hit like five, six different outlandish claims about what's going on in that same speech he calls it turnkey totalitarianism and it all it all centers on how uh covid quarantine measures and vaccines are part of this plot to yeah. take away your freedom and impose authoritarian control over every aspect of your life and bill gates by the way has thousands of uh satellites and drones that are going to be surveilling us at all times wow yeah, that's he loves a harp on Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think it's interesting. They're like, they're going to control your every, you know, the 5G is going to control your every yeah. motion or move or like your thoughts. And it's like, just like how I bought a bunch of Facebook ads um, to mm -hmm. tell you about how vaccines are evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's about as literal of a tinfoil hat conspiracy as you can get. You got to protect your brain from the 5G because it's coming and it's going to control you. And it's in that same speech in front of, uh, you know, a few thousand people at the Lincoln Memorial. It's really stunning to see him standing in front of an American flag, uh, behind an American, in, in front of an American flag. And behind all of that is the statue of Lincoln, so iconic. And in that same speech, he says, uh, he compares Americans wanting to not be vaccinated against COVID to Anne Frank and says that it was easier yes. for Anne Frank to escape the Nazis than it would be for Americans to escape the surveillance state that Bill Gates is setting up. And spoiler alert, Anne Frank did not escape the fucking yeah. Nazis. <laughs> yes, yeah, spoil. God. That's oh kind God. of why her story survived, actually. Yeah, yeah. Sure, we didn't take away what we should have taken away from mm -hmm. the Anne Frank story. That is, I mean, first of all, obviously, I gotta. What is it? The law that you have to compare everything to Nazism. Yeah, yeah. Um, even God though, wins, I think. Right, even though that's yeah. should be our shit because that's what it is. Now, here's the scary part: he's not actually polling that bad. Mm -hmm. He is polling at 19 percent. This is yep. an article that compares him to Ron DeSantis, who's also just polling at 21 percent. Uh huh. Um, why? Julian, please explain this. Well, it's it's very interesting. First of all, he has name recognition, so we can't we can't sort of sell that short. Uh, sure. Second of all, Biden, you know, Biden doesn't really uh, evoke a lot of enthusiasm, so people are are interested in who else may be available. And I know there are plenty of progressive voices saying we need someone else who's going to you know really uh, get in there with a good progressive agenda and and enact it courageously. Uh, but there's another piece here, which is that I think we live in a time of populist appeal 
where mm-hmm. someone who is coming from the outside, again, here's another outsider, just like Trump was an outsider, right? Who, yeah, who, sure, right. A, a man of the people. Um, you have someone coming from outside of mainstream politics, shall we say, with, with we call it on the podcast, um, uh, forbidden knowledge or, or stigmatized knowledge, right? And this is where you get an interesting, our podcast is called Conspirituality, you get this interesting overlap between conspiracy theories and more sort of spiritual claims that I would put like alternative medicine in that camp kind of, right? Because there's a sort Mm -hmm. of magical sense about how alternative medicine is supposed to work. Stigmatized knowledge is any knowledge that has been uh, rejected by mainstream authority, by science, uh, and perhaps by the political mainstream. So you have a figure like this who can come along, who has soaring rhetoric, and who is... uh, you know, saying all of the things that a lot of people want to hear about how COVID was mishandled, about how Fauci really should be prosecuted, about how we don't know what's in those vaccines, and I'm being censored. And the Twitter files show that, you know, government and, and big tech were, were colluding with university think tanks to censor all sorts of voices, and we should stand up against that. So, so he has a lot of that momentum going for him. But here's the wild thing. Uh, reporting just this past Friday on NBC essentially gave him what I call the royal straight flush poker hand of uh, endorsements here. He got Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, Mike Flynn, Alex Jones, and Charlie Kirk all basically saying uh, he's an anti-globalist, he's a populist, he's a man of integrity. Uh, Alex Jones says he campaigns against those poisonous shots. They're all in favor of him because he opposes U.S. support for Ukraine. Uh, Charlie Kirk said it would be a dream ticket if he became Trump's running mate. (laughs) So these are are not good signs, but you see how this this weird kind of populist um, overlap between right and left can start to happen. Yeah, and is he... Because I don't know much about his history with Bannon, but Mm. um, I have read and I don't know if it's true that Bannon's been trying to recruit RFK Jr. to run for president for a while. Do you know any more about his Bannon connection? I don't, actually. All I saw was just this recent uh, glowing kind of endorsement that Bannon did on, on his show. But it doesn't surprise me. I mean, Bannon is... Bannon is deeply networked with a, with a group of people who really do want to move America closer and closer to something like Orban's Hungary. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he uh, this is not a conspiracy theory. Bannon hosts uh, gala dinners around the world where he invites far right leaders from multiple different countries, some of whom are well known, like Orban, um, uh, uh, Duterte, um, uh who was the guy in the Philippines? I'm forget not the Philippines uh, in Brazil. I'm forgetting his name. Yeah, Bolsonaro. Um, Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. Yeah. So so Le he's, Pen in France. Yeah, he's formed all of those kinds of alliances, and it doesn't surprise me that he would see RFK Jr. as a useful pawn in that kind of game. Whether it's to sow chaos on the left, or it's to create some kind of weird uh, red brown alliance, as you uh, alluded yeah. to last time we talked. I know. And last time we talked, by the way, again, was was about Marianne Williamson, yeah. who has her own angle on this. Um, and I just, John, I wanted you to jump in here because I wanted your thoughts on, you know, these candidates who sometimes say the progressive thing, say the thing that feels like we would otherwise agree with them. So here's RFK yeah. Jr. yesterday tweeting between October 2021 20 and September 2022, the U.S. spent eight hundred and seventy seven billion dollars on the military, more than the next 10 countries combined. These huge military expenditures, along with the rising cost of a for profit health care system, have driven the U.S. national debt over thirty one trillion, nearly five trillion more. So, again, we don't necessarily go there on the debt because it's not the number one thing on mm-hmm. our minds or anyone's minds. But he's hammering the for-profit healthcare industry. He's hammering the military budget. And yet he's a rabid anti-vaxxer, doesn't believe in any pharma, to say nothing of big pharma. I don't know. What do you, what does that say about like yeah. the left and uh, and just like, you know, electoral politics generally? So I don't know him. So I don't know to what extent he's reflecting his deeply founded actual beliefs that we've had other examples of this that I think we can probably think of pretty easily that clearly they are chasing right wing money. Like we know that basically what the right wants at all times is people with some credibility on the left to uh, perhaps wholly get rid of whatever positions they had, or perhaps as you're seeing with him, still, you know, speak out against military spending or big farm or whatever to maintain a little bit of plausible deniability about what the state of your ideology actually is. And then 
direct all of this, I think, well-founded concern about things like the degradation of the environment, the, the lies of pharmaceuticals, the spending on the military, but only ever against Democrats transgressing on those things. Mm -hmm. Like, take all those concerns and never apply them to the Republicans who will get elected if you follow my political strategy. Mm -hmm. yep. And then, oh yeah, well, let Trump get elected and uh, military spending will definitely go down then. <laughs> um, we won't be, you know, engaging in any, you know, wars in, um, you know, Yemen or anything. And so it's like, it's a weaponizing of people who are honest, but haven't been well trained necessarily by the American education system to think critically, do their own research, who have, I think, a justifiable suspicion of mainstream media. And so they don't trust most, you know, sort of mainstream sources of information. Mm -hmm. They're primed to believe that this stigmatized forbidden knowledge that they're being given is special because it's coming from someone who says that they're you know being shut out and all that you combine all of these things and every bit of it is understandable especially the stakes like people are going to freak out if they think that kids lives are on the line if they believe that pharmaceutical companies had have lied to them but when you just combine all of these things it just has potentially horrific outcomes that can be weaponized um by people who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo yeah, and I actually have to say, though, I have to lay the blame on the Democratic Party again. And it's not on some like, that's why we must abandon Democratic Party. No, but it's on the leadership to have left such a vacuum. And the fact that we have, you know, it, the party has strayed so far from any sort of FDR goals, right, has become such a corporatist party um, that the lane of saying we spend too much on the military and not enough on actually what helps children, which is education and access or and or guaranteed health care. Um, yeah. What actually helps us um, here is safe housing and 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 whatnot and not an over policing, et cetera, et cetera. Like they just they have no line. They have no line. And so you get, you know, they spend years saying Bernie's not really a Democrat. Fuck Bernie. Stop coming for our shit when Bernie's the best thing that ever happened to like any kind of, you know, let's say left of Hillary politics mm -hmm. in in, you know, years and you leave the lane open for what? For Donald Trump to pick up that Bernie mantle and just echo yep. the populist message, say literally say things like, um, you know, the establishment, mm -hmm. which is now when you say the establishment, it, you just sound like a right winger. Right. Mm -hmm. You like you you mostly sound like a right winger. Uh, mainstream media, you sound like a right winger because fucking T Tucker Carlson says that. So. It makes me mad because it makes me feel like there is no leadership and there's no not only there's no leadership from the Democratic Party, but fundamentally there is no politics for them to even want to gra take up that mantle because they don't stand for anything. So anyway, th but but yeah, I mean, it's Julian yeah. Bannon, Alex Jones, mm -hmm. Charlie Kirk. My I did a double take because. RFK Jr. is running for the Democratic primary mm -hmm. nomination. Mm -hmm. Why? Explain that. Yeah, it's I mean, some of it may be that they want to create chaos on the left and so they're like, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, yeah. we're, we're going to we're going to throw our weight behind this guy. Some of it is that they see that he might be someone who they can flip in some way, maybe becomes an independent uh, and that splits the vote on the left. Maybe he eventually maybe he goes, I'm going to partner with Trump. And he makes some kind of, you know, rationalizing argument. I don't know. I don't think this would happen. But in that scenario that he would make some kind of rationalizing argument that he could uh, he could have a, a good effect on Trump and together they could do wonderful things for the, the, the true people in the heartland of America. But, you know, when you when you look at I think when we look at Kennedy and we look at Williamson and you brought up Tulsi, um, th there's a way that they're each maybe in, in perhaps in different ways emblematic of a kind of. Uh, a lack of ideological kind of rootedness, a lack mm -hmm. of political education, a lack of experience in terms of how politics works, and and perhaps a naivete. You know, Kennedy uh, in March sat down for a two-hour American thought leaders interview with Epoch Times. So, you know, he's willing to give Epoch Times two hours and, and, and a video that you have to click through from an old YouTube excert to go and watch the whole things to Epoch Times and give them your email. I mean, I don't think he this knows. This is the, the Falun Gong, by the way, right? Yeah. This is their movement. Yeah. 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 So, their, or so, their paper. So if there's if there's that kind of naivete, I, feel I think like I'm going to end up working for the Epoch Times the way my career is going. <laughs> Epoch Times is going to I will would never work for the Epoch Times. Either um, that or, or Russia Today.
<laughs> wow. No, uh, they wouldn't hire me. I tried. No, I, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that, it, uh, you're right. Exactly. And of course, a profound sense of ego, which you have to have, I think, no matter mm -hmm. what, if you're running for president. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and, and I mean, all of those people that we listed that were surprised are, are saying positive things about him. What they, what they have in common with him is the COVID denialism anti-quarantine measures, anti-vaccine, uh, the globalists are coming for us. They want to take away our guns. They want to they want to take away our national identity. Well, maybe the, the national identity piece they don't have in common with him, but it's still that libertarian sense that somehow your sovereign freedoms are being imposed upon. And that's where there is this overlap with what we cover on the podcast in terms of the more kind of spiritual wellness alternative medicine community is that there's a strong sense of like, don't tell me what to do with my body. Right, 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 right. I mean, what's so fucked, right? And and the pandemic turbocharged this, and that's why your podcast is so great, right? Is is that again back to you know laying the f blame at the feet of the Democrats for not taking up these mantles? I also, you know, the blame of the mistrust in healthcare and the mm -hmm. pharmaceutical industry, allowing them to get away with charging us any price, Absolutely. allowing them to to hurt us, um, to you know, obviously lead to massive. Um, you know, epidemics and addiction, but then also the lack of access to healthcare and the fact that people can't mm -hmm. pay, pay for it. And, you know, remember that TikTok, John, from the pandemic, or maybe Julian, you saw it too, where it was like, a woman was like, if the vaccine is, you know, so great, then how come they're giving away for free? Uh -huh. You know, why is, why doesn't it cost anything? And you're like, good point, honey. You're all, you're so close, right? <laughs> you're so close to like, you're almost a Medicare for all person, you're just missing this one thing. Yeah, I mean, you're describing really well the conditions uh, of unregulated rapacious capitalism and pe people having no social safety net in, in which a, a certain kind of populism and conspiratorial mindset can be exploited by people yes. who, who want to do so. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Can, can I also throw in to uh, this is sort of uh, carrying on from your talk about sort of what the overlap would be between him and, and them and this definite knee jerk, like, how dare you tell me what to do thing, which is very much there, but also like, it's a very specific demographic version of that. Mm -hmm. How dare you tell me, a white individual, <laughs> male, generally, yeah. what mm -hmm. to do? The yeah. rest of you, you can tell them to do whatever the hell you want. Like, yeah. like RFK might believe some stuff that I believe about the environment or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and he definitely in his rhetoric will, will stress how your rights are being taken away. But he's also effectively telling people to ignore the way that people's rights are not hypothetically in the future being taken away by robots in the sky, but have been being taken away by legislation right now. It's just people that don't necessarily look like RFK or perhaps some of the people yeah. in the audience. If you're, exactly. you know, your reproductive rights are being stripped away, if it's much harder for you to vote, if your representatives are being silenced, if you your, your ability to like they're saying, don't you dare ask me to put a vaccine in my body. But if you're OK with the government banning gender affirming care when it comes to hormonal therapy, yeah. then you don't have the libertarian view that you seem to think you oh, do. Oh, totally, totally, See? totally. And yeah. and all this, we're, we're in such an upside down world right now with all of this. You mentioned the book bannings earlier, all of this crying about censorship and then turn around and ban books. Um, it's 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 this ongoing the, the the takeover of New College in Florida by DeSantis and Chris Rufo. This this whole sense that you're going to enact a set of actual dr draconian authoritarian measures in the name of trying to protect all of the the constitutional rights we have that the woke mind virus is trying to take away from us. It's it's so crazy and so dishonest. And one of the disturbing things about Kennedy that we haven't touched on yet, and I wanted mm -hmm. to just piggyback on what you were saying, John, is, you know, he has used his political capital that comes from his family, especially with regards to the civil rights history, to uh, make great inroads into African American communities and into immigrant communities, black and brown immigrant communities, and spread his anti-vaccine messages there. He's partnered with people like Tony Muhammad from Nation of Islam. Uh, he's partnered with Black Lives Matter leaders and with, with um, people who are African-Americans who are running for a Senate uh, to go in there and basically get the ball rolling on a lot of uh, suspicion about vaccines. And it's led to some terrible Jesus things in, in Samoa. 
in 2019, he, he went to uh, the American embassy there and was photographed with anti-vaccine activists. He wrote a letter to the president of Samoa and said, um, you really need to be suspicious about the MMR vaccine. Led to a measles outbreak. 5,700 people were infected. Wow. 83 people died. Uh, he he with with Tony Muhammad he co-produced a documentary called a documentary called Medical Apartheid, which uses the Tuskegee syphilis study. He's not afraid to exploit actual medical atrocities yes. to try to then spread this false idea that uh, black and brown boys are more, especially boys, are more susceptible to severe vaccine side effects. But it's been covered up by the CDC, and to really try to campaign on this idea that he's standing up for people of color, it's appalling. No, that, that's so, um, yeah, that's so insidious and, and, and awful. And no one's gonna hold them accountable. And I think it's really interesting, uh, Julian, you could tell me this. Have there been any women to capitalize on the vaccine and the fact that like actually one of the side effects of it in the COVID-19 vaccine was it made menstrual periods incredibly uh, heavy? Oh, like, so many. <laughs> There have been okay, good. So I was like, we oh, need yeah. our we we need our like anti-vax women to like yeah. you know sp uh, spout doc, that. Doctor Christiane Northrup is a major one. Kelly yes. Brogan, a former former psychiatrist, Kelly Kelly Brogan is another one. Northrup um, hasn't received. She hasn't she she hasn't gotten her period in how long? Come on. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, but the but the idea was that this was being covered up. It was bad for women. You know, this is part of the the, the crossover in terms of conspirituality. Is there's also a lot of this. Um, the, the archetype of the sacred feminine, the sense that yeah. an, an earth goddess and that really what's going to heal the world is if we go back to the earth and go back to what are sort of labeled as feminine principles, which, uh, you know, include a lot of this kind of misinformation. But with the COVID mm -hmm. vaccines, yes, there was this um, a lot of people fear talked about the effects. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of fear mongering about how it was going to affect your baby or how you were not going to be able to get pregnant. And oh then my God. Christian, Christian Northrup even came up with this idea that if your partner had been vaccinated, you could, you could get the spike proteins from them. There was like some kind of <sighs> contagion from the spike proteins. And she actually said on her Instagram that women who had male partners who were getting vaccinated should refuse to have sex with them. Jesus. And that's yeah, no, how this... we're going to save the world. And then dudes started selling their anti-vax cum. I mean, it, we're, we're arguably in a better place now somehow, but also we've been forever like, yes, marred by the anti-vax movement. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, in terms of that sacred feminine stuff, please listen to the Marianne Williamson um, discussion because I think it's true that there was there is something captivating about her kind of like hearkening to that feminine energy and even it sort of like interests me and I'm like, oh. But anyway, um, any last words on Kennedy Julian before uh, like, oh, oh, final thoughts on how much is this Q related? Is there any Q related mm. stuff? I know that QAnon followers have been waiting under a bridge in Dallas for, you know, JFK Jr. to come back or JFK himself. It's not clear. Yeah. Um, are they immediately attracted to RFK? I haven't seen anything about that yet. I mean, I think the, the important thing that I always want to bear in mind when the, the topic of QAnon comes up is mm. that QAnon is, is, QAnon is not like a, it's not like, a political party. It's not like a, a group. It's not like the, um, you, you know, some kind of group that you can join and you all wear funny hats and you gather together for conventions, the Shriners or something, right? It's, it's not, not like MAGA. No, it's not, it's, exactly. not, it's not like MAGA. Yeah. It is this, it is this sort of morphing, evolving online phenomenon that cobbles together whatever conspiracy theories are speaking to the moment. And mm. it's opportunistic. There's a whole group of influencers who became the people who were interpreting the Q drops and right. then selling merch off of that and then building their YouTube following before they get kicked off some of them off of that. And so there, there's a real, uh, it, it's, a, it's a digital religion, if you will. It's an opportunistic capitalist enterprise that relies on e-commerce. It is, it is basically taking, if we consider that each time the media evolved into going back to the printing press each time it evolved to reach more people there were always conspiracy theories that were being spread and right. di digital proliferation is just faster and more virulent than anything we've ever seen before so you know will there be people who espouse the main sort of tenets of QAnon who end up wanting to ride on RFK Jr's coattails yeah sure 
but you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say like he's connected to QAnon in some kind of like. Well, yeah, way. in yeah. the. I mean, sort of. I mean, John, we've covered this, but like in the same way that like Marjorie Green isn't Q, but yeah. like, and Trump isn't Q, but will play a song from them and That's right. definitely do a bunch of hat tips because it's a actual constituency. They're they're happy to they're happy to dog whistle to that constituency often in ways that are audible to the rest of us, right? Absolutely. Um, Julian Walker, thank you so much for joining thank us. Uh, this is scary and also important. Um, everybody listen to Conspirituality and buy the book, which is out very soon. Thanks so much. All right. Take good care. And John, we got one more segment, if that wasn't scary enough. We do. God. Let's get <laughs> scarier. Let's get scarier. Let's look at them polls. This is Ron V. Don. So I put this up a little bit earlier, but this is exciting for RFK um, that <laughs> Robert Kennedy is polling at 19 percent, according to a recent Fox News poll. And DeSantis is just polling at 21 percent, um, which is not good. Um, DeSantis was at 28 percent in Fox's February poll, 15 points behind Trump. The Florida governor's support has dropped now in the last two Fox polls published since. And he now trails the former president by 32 points. And just for some context, in terms of early polling indicators of all primary elections since 1972 without incumbents running, candidates at around 30 percent in early primary polls like DeSantis was in February have gone on to become their party's nominees about 40 percent of the time. So not great. Candidates polling the way DeSantis is polling now, however, gone on to win about 20 percent of the time. Yeah. Um, DeSantis is, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about why he might not be building momentum, but have, has, has it, has the ship sailed, even though he might announce at any moment, John? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's necessarily sailed just in that he has potential outs. Not all of the cards have been flipped over and you never know, maybe exactly what you need, uh, does flip in time for his what does he do he's gonna like just declare succession secession from the union i don't i mean be look, like well i'm president anyway what it could be that you know D donald trump gets locked up and that helps him although i'm not sure that it would necessarily might help trump at this point but that's a wild card that could happen uh biden could keel over with a massive stroke and that throws things into chaos he don't goes viral that. on tiktok i don't know i don't even know what those cards would be but just because he hasn't yet actually declared he hasn't actually debated trump yet maybe he has maybe he has like collected to him some of the most brutal advertisement creators because he's definitely not going to be the guy to shred Trump, but a shredding must come for him to win. Maybe he's got people who can outdo the pudding ad. I don't think that any of those things are likely. And I think that what we're seeing is just an earlier than expected outcome that we had sort of predicted. He's not particularly charismatic. He's not particularly likable. He can sort of get the right fired up, but that's the lowest bar imaginable. And Trump is better at it than he is. Um, I just think there were a lot of there were a lot of things lined up to be obstacles for Ron DeSantis, and we're just sort of seeing those work out kind of like we expected. I mean, and then the other part of this, and we we're talking about sort of like overly online, you know, elitist white men in the program. Is he just another one of those who like thinks he's giving red meat to the base, but it's really just like nasty trolls on the internet that just want to demonize trans people and women? and immigrants but then when it comes down to it like everyday republican voters are kind of just like everyday any voters who want to um, see some kind of improvement in their daily lives like it's just like he's given them everything he's gone after disney even though he's losing he's gone after trans people he's gone after the stop woke acts he's gone after american history he you know is gone after immigrants shipping them to whatever vice president harris's house like he's doing all the things john like yeah why well, I think the issue is that before he was doing the exact same things that he's doing, but all he needed to do was be in Florida as the governor, and he gave them things that made him popular, and then he needed to be the Democrat, and there were enough right-wingers that loved that stuff that they kept him in office. Now, he needs to beat Trump, but the thing is, like, you being the guy that's going to try to attack the woke and hurt trans people and all of that and hurt immigrants, yeah, all of them will. 
Like every Republican knows that whoever ends up becoming president is probably going to be like that. Donald Trump's got a longer track record than Ron DeSantis. How are you going to beat Trump? on being horrible. Even when it comes to explicitly talking about being anti-woke or attacking trans people, Trump has very easily integrated that into his stump speech. Yeah. I feel he just nullified Ron DeSantis' advantage in that, except he also has the years of the MAGA movement, the belief that he's the one fighting the deep state, all of that stuff. Like he's got whatever advantages Ron DeSantis has, plus his own unique Trumpy je ne sais, je ne sais quoi. Right, exactly. Stephen Miller is just there sort of like adding in the also trans athletes are evil lines yeah. into his speech that he already gives. Um, you're right. No, you're absolutely. It's I easy. feel like when I see Trump do that and parrot lines that you normally see coming out of DeSantis or, you know, any other sort of right wing ghoul, I, I, it almost makes, in my mind, him look a little weak. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, but but it could be the opposite. It could be him just sort of sweeping up the little, you know, the sort of crumbs of whoever is moved by that message. Uh, and also, interestingly, it seems like if he does run against Trump, Trump is willing to hit him. And clearly, as per your reference to the pudding ad, wants to hit him on Medicare and Medicaid and social or Medicare and Social Security and um, wants to uh, like distinguish himself. Um, God, I had another thought, but my fucking brain is hurting me. Um <laughs> That, it's the woke mind virus. It's, it's the woke mind virus. Neurons. It's just uh, like, oh, God, so much social justice. Um, Like, he's willing to, like, really fight him on all of these issues. And so, mm -hmm. um, oh, the other, sorry, vaccines. Vaccines specifically. And and COVID numbers. Trump's trying to run on the fact that he was better on COVID, which I'm very fascinated. Because well, I don't think, I don't think that's going to play. Let me just, I don't think that's going to play to Republicans. But it may play to, like, the gen well, it I, I think it'll play to more moderate Republicans is what I'm saying. Look, it's possible that you're referencing a specific thing that I haven't seen. But in terms of the way that I think he's been trying to battle Ron DeSantis when it comes to COVID, he's been trying to convince them that he was better in that he was worse. He's saying, I didn't shut down the country. He shut down Florida beaches. Right. So he he tried very briefly a little of fight against COVID. And for that, you should probably hang him. Whereas I gave up immediately. I didn't do anything to stop people from dying, which is not 100% true for either of them. And Ron DeSantis did surrender. I, I lost my stepfather in Florida thanks to how wild COVID ran through that state. So, like, after a couple of years of very briefly and to incredibly minor levels of credit for Trump, he tried to encourage the vaccine. That was it? Mm -hmm. But he tried to do that a little bit. He got booed like four times. And then he realized, okay, not doing that anymore. Now I hate yep. the vaccine even more than him. Because he said in one of his ads that DeSantis got vaccinated. And it appears that he did. So he's now flipped okay, even that. Okay, so he's been him. tamed. He's been tamed by his psycho base. I think so, yeah. Into running away from even the one thing that he was maybe right on, which was the vaccines worked and I helped roll them out. Got yeah. it. Fun. That's what it seems like to me. I mean, we'll see once he gets to the, to the general election. Do you think DeSantis will announce? Do you think he's running? I it it feels like if I were DeSantis, I would throw myself off a cruise ship. But no, um, if I were DeSantis, <laughs> I would never be able to look my wife in the eyes. Yes, uh, also that. If I were DeSantis, my kid would have no. You could never eat a meatball again. Uh -huh. Yeah. No. If I were DeSantis, I would burn those boots. No. If I were DeSantis, I would not. <laughs> I would not announce because I don't see how you get out of that without doing serious, long lasting harm to your reputation, by which I mean what Republicans think of you, your anti reputation. John, what's what's the video game questy story like analogy where in order to win, you have to defeat your mentor? Is it is it Star Wars -y or th is this his Obi Wan? Do you know what I'm saying? Um. Oh yeah. Okay. So, uh, in in Obi Wan, actually, okay, there was uh, this uh, dark figure who had been working <laughs> undercover to betray Darth Vader, and oh. that was always going to be a super long shot. How do you take down Darth Vader? Yeah. And when difficult. she finally decided to do that, it was the Wait, most she? blunt. She. Yeah. Oh, so so the Vaders have gone woke. 
<laughs> exactly. Well, the, the Vader servants have gone woke. Uh, it was the most blundering, pointless attack that immediately got her struck down. <laughs> that really feels like what we're experiencing here. It's like he's give, being given all of these signals that there's no way this can work. He is going to step onto that debate stage and leave a shrunken man with urine running down his legs. I think you I think you're right. I'm and 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 you, you know this and just an analogy or sort of an analogously to what happened in 2004 when John Kerry ran against George W. Bush but tried to basically in, you like had no other line on the war on terror other than I'm going to get Osama first. I'm mm -hmm. going to kill the terrorist debtor and you're like no 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 you need something else. And DeSantis, unlike Trump against DeSantis, DeSantis doesn't really have a line on why it should be him other than Trump. Like, not a good one. At least definitely not a political line. Not a political one. He, I mean, look, if he wanted to attack Trump for being so wild and chaotic that he undercuts conservative policy priorities, he could try to do that. If he wanted to attack him for, you know, like flagrant, flagrantly, uh, you know, breaking the law multiple times, he could do that. If he wanted to point out that the guy has clearly cheated on his wife multiple times, betraying sure. the supposed conservative family values, is a rapist. he could do that. Oh, also, yeah, don't forget he's a rapist. Um, the issue is that he would probably be hurt more by pointing out these inconvenient facts. They'd be like, oh, you haven't raped anyone? He's like, ah, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Are you really alpha if you haven't raped a couple dozen women? I'm, pretty much. I mean, um, that's that's the base that he's trying to attract. I think yeah. you're right. I think you're right. And I think that he should wait. I think he should probably just wait. Although, to be fair, Trump has also implied that were he not to win this time, that he would run in 2028. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what would be left of him at that point. I I want Trump to continue running until he's just like brain from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he already kind of <laughs> looks like him. He's just like there's some sort of SpaceX suit that's surrounding <laughs> his gelatinous like little ball of a brain. Um, and he still runs. It's just a brain in a jar and the jar is smeared with tanner. <laughs> <laughs> How do I look? Wait, yeah. I've got a position. He's got to position himself there right where the makeup is. Yep. And, it, and the, the jar floats like eight feet above the floor, but the tie that's tied around, it still drags on the ground. <laughs> like Somebody Photoshop that with mid journey. <laughs> oh, anyway. John Idarola of the Damage Report. You're wonderful. You're amazing. Thank you so much for Thank joining. You. Everybody, check out the Damage things. Report and Thank check you. out John. John is actually a writer. Speaking of writing and being in solidarity with them, John, where people can, where can people read your works of fiction? I wrote one of those books back there. But anyway, uh, I write short sci-fi, fantasy, post-apocalyptic fiction available at patreon.com slash John Arola. Every month I put out a work of original fiction. I do podcasts, behind the scenes, oh my uh, God. dramatic readings, uh, a lot of fun stuff. So patreon.com slash John Arola. I think uh, my I... newest short story just came out yesterday. It's called Inertia's Lament. It's a sci-fi adventure story. Inertia's Lament. That sounds... Oh, you probably can't tell, but it's nerdy. Oh no, that does sound. <laughs> it just sounds like our political system, like a little bit. A little inertia's bit. lament. It's um, gonna be my autobiography too. <laughs> indeed, no. Uh, that'll have something to do with pop tarts, um, popping tarts, and shooting darts. All right, I'm done. Okay, bye, John. Love you, and thank you guys uh, for being here for sticking around. I'm just gonna read some of your comments and get the f out of here. Um, Terrence Trumbo, thank you for being. A member says Ron's meatballs don't have enough spice to surpass Trump. Indeed. Um, ugh, gross. Um, sea fish. I'm upset the vaccine didn't give me powers or mutations. Yeah, I, I want, I just want them to all, I want the powers to activate at some point, you know, um, like go, go gadget style. Uh, no sacred cow. Thank you for the super chat. DeSantis made sure his rich donors got the vaccine before he went anti-vax. Yeah. Do you guys remember watching like old people in Florida lining up? Um, and then he lied about the numbers. Uh, that was fun. And then, oh yeah, uh, what is it? Sent some people to the uh, data person in charge of COVID numbers at the like like health secretary's office or home. I got that story completely right. Um, 
Graf 1980 says, Dragon Baby Parents Unite. Indeed, John is an expectant parent. I'm so, so, so excited. I'm very, very excited for him. Um, um, Mauro, Mauro Hermida, thank you so much for the super chat. Matt's B-Day present, you say, better than poo in a box. I'm not sure what that's in reference to, but maybe it's the cat box. Um, Camper Man, thank you so much for becoming a, a member. The VARS3 saying you're killing the Shigo outfit. I guess I'm dressed as Shigo again. Um, versus Donald Trump on YouTube. Eek, is anyone else getting the vibe that our society is either about to turn the corner or at least a little bit of sanity to at least a bit of sanity or slide to the edge of the flat earth? Yes, that's exactly sort of what I tried to mention earlier. That's how I feel. Like we are at the precipice now. Laura Squirrel, thank you for your super chat. As a trans woman in Indiana... I'm scared they will come after adults once the ban signed around trans kids takes effect on July 1st. I am so sorry. And I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think it's a legitimate fear. I think this has always been a ploy to actually criminalize all trans people. This is not just about children. We know the right doesn't care about children. And if they did, uh, they would actually support them in living how they want to live and being who they want to be. But um, it's not about that. Uh, it's not even about the parents also. Um, not about parents' rights. Um, Jeff Curry on YouTube, so he would rape his type in reference to Trump? Indeed. Yeah, I guess so. Even though he confused E. Jean Carroll with his former wife, Marla Maples. Remember that? That was fun. Half Dead Shepherd said, this is like the damage report, but how viewers actually want it. Love you, Francesca. Hi, John. I think that's a, thank you so much. Yes, we get to wax a little bit longer here on this show and I am, yeah. I get to be incoherent. No, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Robert, thank you for your super chat. In Trump's defense, he believes humans are his cattle put on earth for him to feed upon. So nothing in his life has proved has much proved him wrong. I guess so. I mean, he throws ketchup all over the cattle. Um, Dank Prol on Twitch says, it's Q's been quiet recently. Feels like it's just what Republicans believe these days. Yeah, I think you don't have a movement that's like secretive anymore when you're psycho talking points have just been uh, co-opted by the so-called mainstream Republicans. When you've got Marjorie Greene and others in office, it's like your work is done. You did it. Congrats. Uh, and thanks everyone else for being here. Um, let's get it started. Let's get it popping with the fart song and thanking everyone going over to Twitch. <laughs> Thank you to Punch Up Dragon for resubscribing with Prime. Subscribe for nine months. Nemo 1870 Dragon gave out 10 community subs. You gorgeous human being. Thank you, Nemo Dragon. Also gave out five community subs a little bit ago. 15. Good God. Do I have to bring out the cat now? There she is. We brought her out. Thank you. Um, Picks of you both subscribe with Prime. Thank you. Um, and Narc subscribed for one month at Tier 1 uh, four days ago. Thanks so much. And we have no big tippers and no pa new patrons at $10 or more. So I just wanted to do a little bit of a shout out to some of the oldest uh, members of the Orchata Armada and the uh, Innermost Cabal. Laramie, thank you so much for all of your support. Uh, you know we love you. Uh, Timothy Brennan, thank you. Uh, DM Munsinger, thank you. Uh, D Munsinger, thanks so much. Liliana Hansen, Leith, as always. Bonnie V, Rural Lefty, Edward Chavez, Luke Williams, John Reed, Ken O'Donnell, Ed Merson, Anna Democracia, Little Mac, Chris Missile, Juan Vasquez, Jonathan Ferreira, and Arthur Vern V, and Chris. I'm just uh, shouting you all out. Thank you so much. I think some of you, I think some of you are still active, but if you're not, thanks so much for being patrons. See you on Friday for the bonus fish. Thanks to Paige Omek, to Maximilian Inhoff, to Andy Vasoyan, our editor. Remember, we stream every Tuesday and Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Fridays for the bonus and the patrons. And remember, don't fight the power. Fuck the patriarchy. And don't just bitch about it. Don't just bitch about it. Don't just bitch about it. Be about it.